Welcome everybody to this uh, session, um, which has an interesting title of Potpourri of Comorbidities, and maybe one of the French speakers, Dominique, would uh, explain later what, uh, what, where the word potpourri derives from. But uh, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Dominique, <laughs> but I actually look, looked it up and was quite uh, shocked, but anyway. Uh, maybe we'll do it at the end of the session. Anyway, my name is Peter Rice from the University of uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and I'm very happy to co-chair this session with Adiba Kamarozaman from Malaysia, University of Malaysia. And we just decided that we'd uh, take turns, so uh, Adiba will introduce the first three speakers, and I will introduce the last three speakers. Adiba. Thank you, Peter. And I have great pleasure in uh, inviting Assistant Professor Jessica Castillo, I hope I said that right, from Vanderbilt University, and her paper is entitled Trends and Predictors of Non-Communicable Disease Multimorbidity Among HIV-Infected Adults Initiating ART in Brazil. Good afternoon. Make sure we get everything up. Great. Good afternoon, and along with my co-authors, I'd like to thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to share our results of our study on the trends and predictors of non-communicable disease multimorbidity among HIV-infected adults initiating ART in Brazil. In high-resource settings, it's increasingly recognized that older HIV-positive adults on antiretroviral therapy bear a heavy burden of multimorbidity from non-communicable diseases. Multimorbidity has been associated with functional decline, loss of quality of life, and early mortality in HIV-positive adults. However, less is known of the burden of multimorbidity from NCDs in low- and middle-income countries. Through funding from the Brazilian Ministry of Health, Coarchi Brazil was established as a multi-site observational cohort study to examine the clinical and virologic outcomes of HIV-positive adults initiating ART across the country. In partnership with the Caribbean, Central American, and South American Network for HIV Epidemiology, or CASINET, Non-communicable disease outcomes were collected and validated from seven clinical sites located in six cities in the Coarchi cohort. For this study, our primary outcome of interest was incident multimorbidity, defined as the accumulation of two or more NCDs following ART initiation. For our analyses, we use Poisson regression to examine the incidence trends of individual NCDs and multimorbidity over time, and Cox proportional hazard models to examine patient characteristics at ART initiation associated with the development of multimorbidity. Our study included a total of more than 5,500 adults initiating ART whom contributed more than 20,000 person years of follow-up. The cohort was 33% female, and the median age at ART initiation was 36 years. The average CD4 count at baseline was 226 cells, and nearly 70% of all patients initiated an ART regimen containing an NNRTI. 70 patients, or 5% of all patients, had one prevalent NCD at the time of ART initiation. Patients contributed an average of 3.9 years of follow-up after ART initiation, and 10% of those included died during observation. Of all participants included, a total of 989 incident NCD outcomes were evaluated. The most frequent NCD was high-grade lipid disorders, which was defined as a total cholesterol greater than 300, or LDL greater than 190, or triglycerides greater than 750 milligrams per deciliter. The second most frequent NCD observed was diabetes, followed by osteoporosis, including osteopenia. The other NCDs examined occurred at lower frequencies. We first examined the trends in incidence of the individual NCD diagnoses over time. 
While many of the individual NCDs had rates that remained statistically stable over the observation period, we observed a trend of a decreasing rate of high-grade lipid disorders, an increasing rate of diabetes, and an increasing rate of osteoporosis and osteopenia, particularly in the latter years of observation. While rates of many individual NCDs remained stable over time, we observed a steadily increasing rate of incident multimorbidity with either two or more NCDs as shown in the orange line or three or more NCDs as shown in the green line over the study period. This rise in incident multimorbidity was paralleled by the increasing proportion of person time in the cohort contributed by patients over the age of 50 years. By the last year of observation in 2014, more than 20% of all persons in the cohort were over the age of 50. We next turned our attention to examining the patient characteristics associated with the development of multimorbidity. We observed that compared to males, females experienced a higher cumulative incidence of multimorbidity following ART initiation. In multivariable analyses, which also accounted for clinical site, race, age, education, CD4 nadir, history of hepatitis C, calendar year, and presence of NCD at the time of ART initiation, the statistically significant increased risk experienced by females persisted. Not unexpectedly, we observed that older age at the time of ART initiation was associated with increased risk of multimorbidity. In adjusted analyses, patients over the age of 50 at the time of ART initiation had a six-fold increased risk of developing incident multimorbidity compared to those under the age of 30. Finally, we also observed that patients with the lowest CD4 nadir at the time of ART initiation experienced an increased cumulative incidence of multimorbidity. This association persisted in our multivariable analyses. We next sought to further examine the sex difference that we observed. By examining the individual NCD diagnoses experienced by patients with multimorbidity by sex. Of the 288 patients who developed multimorbidity, 167 were males and 121 were females. The males experienced a total of 380 NCDs and females experienced a total of 280 NCDs. For both males and females, the most frequent NCD diagnosed was high-grade lipid disorders diagnosed in 40% of males and 35% of females. The second most frequent was diabetes, which was which occurred, um, excuse me, which accounted for 20, approximately 25% of diagnoses in both males and females. However, the third most frequent NCD in females was osteoporosis and osteopenia, contributing 15% of NCD diagnoses in females and 6% of those in males. Our study has some important limitations to remember. First, there's no standardized list of non-communicable diseases in the HIV literature from which to build a definition of multimorbidity. Our study focused on the NCDs that reflect end organ disease and those which were identified by the sites as clinical priorities. However, we did not include outcomes such as pulmonary disease, neuropsychiatric disease, or hypertension, which may be important contributors to multimorbidity in aging HIV-infected adults. Additionally, our study lacks complete data on important behavioral characteristics, including alcohol and tobacco use, as well as weight and height data from which to calculate BMI. It's quite possible that these variables may contribute, it, may contribute to unmeasured confounding in our models. Finally, while we sought to limit the, these limitations statistically, this is an observational study and is reflective of the data that was present in the medical records and subject to variability across clinical sites included. 
With those limitations acknowledged, this study also has many important strengths. As a multi-site cohort study of NCDs and multimorbidity from a middle-income country. Brazil is a unique and important country to study aging outcomes in HIV, in part because ART has been widely available in the country since 1996. Additionally, observational research is strengthened in Brazil by its national systems for ART and laboratory monitoring. Our study was a multi-site study and was strengthened by the geographic and clinical diversity of the cohorts included. And finally, our study was improved by the rigorous validation of all of the N NCD outcomes that we included. In conclusion, we found that multimorbidity from non-communicable diseases is increasing among aging adults in, on ART in Brazil. And after adjusting for CD4 and age, female sex was independently associated with an increased risk. Hyperlipidemia and diabetes accounted for the majority of NCD comorbidities. However, osteoporosis increasingly contributed to multimorbidity, particularly among females. I'd like to acknowledge the many people who contributed to this study, as well as our founders. And with that, I'll take any questions. We invite questions from the floor to Jessica, please. Jessica, thank you for excellent thank presentation. Um, very interesting data. I do have a question for you. I recognize that your, your study is focused on HIV positive adults, which is excellent. What I was not able to appreciate, and maybe you've been able to do this um, as you thought about your data, is to think, um, to get a sense of the relative rate of these NCDs and multimorbidity relative to the um, HIV uninfected, because um, in most places in the world, middle income and up, the rise of NCDs is, um, is an issue we all appreciate, but whether HIV infection accelerates that prevalence or incidence is um, data that I think could be strengthened. Thank you. Thank you very much for that important point, and, and, and it is a very good one and a limitation of our study in terms of not having, uh, most importantly, uh, a comparable population of HIV uninfected to compare this to. Um, we have done some work looking at specific NCDs and, and how that compares to expectations in the general population. Um, in one of our sites, we examined the risk of cancers and found that that was non or, I'm sorry, non-AIDS cancers and found that those occurred at higher frequency in the HIV population at that site compared to what was expected from national rates. Um, but it, it is something uh, that uh, in terms of the general increasing prevalence of NCDs in the general population is something that I think is also very important to consider, so thank you. Would you please state your name and where you're from too, please? Maarten uh, Schim van der Loef, Public Health Service Amsterdam. Thank you for a very nice presentation, interesting study. Um, I saw the striking increase in osteoporosis over the years. Um, that may be partly due to the aging of the cohort, but uh, I think it was too stark for that. Uh, do you think this may be due to increasing awareness among clinicians and increasing ascertainment of that condition? Or do you think that this is a real signal? Thank you, and I, I think that um, that is a, a very good point. And we did adjust for calendar year, um, but I agree that I think it's likely that there are also temporal changes related to osteoporosis screening. Um, there may be others who know this better than I do. I'm not aware of specific osteoporosis screening in HIV-positive adults um, in Brazil, but I suspect that some of the increased uptake in the later years was, was likely changes in clinical practice as well. And if I may follow on with the next question, were you able to look at uh, a possible association with individual ARVs uh, with this outcome? We haven't yet, but we plan to, and, and really to look more specifically at the bone outcomes. Um, that wasn't part of this specific study, but we certainly have interest in that. Okay, we're looking forward to this data. Thank, Thank you. you. Just a quick question from me, because you mentioned you had no access to BMI data, but I was wondering about body weight. Did you have access to body weight? We, we unfortunately don't have weight or height from our sites. Okay. 
which we did. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank Jessica. You. And I would like to invite uh, Associate Professor Matthew Freiberg from Vanderbilt University. He's a physician and a cardiovascular epidemiologist with expertise in HIV and um, cardiovascular disease. Matthew. All right. Good afternoon. Hope everybody's enjoying the conference. On behalf of the VAX investigators and my co-investigators for this particular project, we'd like to thank for the opportunity to present our work. We have no disclosures. Okay, peripheral arterial disease, 10,000 foot view. Um, my colleagues in vascular medicine and surgery think of it generically as atherosclerosis, mid aorta, all the way down through your lower extremities. Approximately 202 million people worldwide suffer from this problem and 8 million people within the United States. It is the second most common or cl largest clinical manifestation of atherosclerosis, secondary to coronary heart disease. And individuals with PAD suffer from an increased risk of future major adverse cardiovascular events, including mortality. And you'll see how this is relevant towards the end of our talk. Some background on HIV and cardiovascular disease. Our group and many others on multiple continents have demonstrated that HIV is associated with an increased risk of acute myocardial infarctions, ischemic stroke, more recently reduced and preserved systolic ejection fraction heart failure. So given that PAD is the second most common presentation of atherosclerosis, it seems like an important question, but there's very little literature on this topic. So our group decided to at least explore an association between HIV infection and PAD. So we analyzed data in the Veterans Aging Cohort Study. So for those of you who don't know what that is, um, it's an observational longitudinal cohort of veterans in care, all the HIV-infected veterans that we have, and matched one to two to age, race, sex, and site within the VA healthcare system. For this analysis, we looked at 92,287 of our participants, approximately 32% with HIV. None of them had prevalent cardiovascular disease. And we followed them from April 1st, 2003, and our data was truncated to the end of December of 2011, and we looked for death, PAD, or their last follow-up date. Now, for this study, we used administrative data to look for vascular disease, and it was difficult to find an appropriate definition. In fact, when we surveyed colleagues both for surgery and for vascular medicine, there isn't a unifying definition. The Bali group is one of the first that's done so, so we used their definition uh, for convenience. We're going to present data with regards to cumulative incidence via plots. We use Cox proportional hazard models to look at the association between HIV and PAD, adjusting for confounders. We also looked at time-updated CD4 and viral load to try to understand what those markers may mean over an eight-year period of time for PAD. And lastly, we've been very interested in our group to look at mortality after the development of CVD in this population. Um, so we're going to present data with regards to Kaplan-Meier curves stratified by HIV status and HIV-specific biomarkers. So a little bit about our data. So there's approximately 29,000 HIV-infected people that you'll see up here, and about 63,000 plus or minus for our uninfected. They're about median age is 48 at the time of enrollment, overwhelmingly male, as this is a, a veteran population, although that's changing in our group. Um, approximately half are African-American, 40% are Caucasian, and the remaining are either Hispanic or other. A lot of data here. Um, these are the risk factors that we looked at to make it a little easier to see differences. So if HIV infected compared to uninfected, you'll notice that low HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides, HCV infection, and anemia um, were far more common in our, our HIV infected population. I want to just take a second about HCV and anemia and why we included them. And at least in our cohort, but not in every cohort, we've linked HCV to increased cardiovascular risk in the uninfected population, there's more data demonstrating that association, as well as association between um, HCV and diabetes. As far as anemia, Amy Justice, uh, my mentor and the head of the VAX, had published an earlier paper linking anemia to increased D-dimer, IL-6, and soluble CD14. As all of those have been linked to CVD and mortality in the HIV population, we felt it appropriate to include it in our model. For the uninfected portion of our, our group, you can see that they had higher prevalence of hypertension, a much higher prevalence of obesity, and not surprisingly, diabetes as well. Just a little bit about our HIV-infected participants. Their median CD4 count was 383. Um, you'll see approximately 50% were on ART, 
at baseline in 2003. So our time-updated CD4 and viral load data are going to be important for us to try to understand what PAD might, might be happening with PAD and the HIV association. So this is our cumulative incidence plot, and you'll see that about after a year, year and a half, they diverge, and it's pretty consistently higher for almost nine years of follow-up here. When you look at these forest plots, these are adjusted models for all the data you saw in Table 1. And what you can see with CD4 count is it's almost like a dose response. As we decrease our CD4 count, the increased risk seems to go up. Viral load, on the other hand, was only dichotomized, so it's a little bit harder to see this individual trend. Um, as Peter asked me when I presented these slides to look at, we did run one last-minute analysis here, um, which I think is important. Um, where we looked at comparing uninfected people to HIV-infected people stratified by CD4 with every CD4 they had over a nine-year follow-up period. And I think it's kind of striking when you look at the CD4 greater than 500. These people who are maintaining a high CD4 count, their risk was 8 percent and it wasn't statistically significant. On the other hand, you're looking at people with CD4 counts less than 200. It's almost a two-fold two risk. We're approaching that. And importantly, remember, these people have mortality rates, at least in our cohort, that are six or seven times higher than our uninfected population, which means, that if anything, this is an underestimate of risk by a competing risk-of-death phenomenon. When we looked at the HIV-infected population only so we could adjust for CD4 and viral load simultaneously, obviously we can't do that when we have an uninfected group as our reference point, you can see here that in the time-updated analysis, both viral load and CD4 are associated with PAD. Importantly, they weren't in our baseline variables, and that's not entirely shocking when you have a snapshot versus nine years of follow-up. Lastly, I want to focus a little bit on this. So this is mortality after PAD. So as I said before, we know in the uninfected population that people with PAD have an increased risk of future cardiovascular events, very similar to people who have an established coronary, heart, coronary event, they're at a higher risk to have a second one. These people are the same with PAD. Mortality is high in this group. If you look at our stratified by CD4, and remember what I said, these people are already exceptional risk for developing PAD. If you look at one year, almost 40 percent of them have already died. By two years, 50 percent have died. And then it levels off a little bit. When I talk to my vascular medicine colleagues, independent of HIV, this is a very common phenomenon. It's an extraordinarily high-risk group. Part of it, and it's not meant for this talk, has to do not only with the large vessel disease, which is what this measure is capturing, but what you're going to see is this issue of microvascular disease. And more importantly, that when you talk to vascular surgeons, even when they do bypasses and even amputations when necessary, the microvascular disease can actually drive the mortality risk despite an intervention. When you look at the viral load, you're seeing a similar phenomenon, again, that people who are unsuppressed have an increased risk of mortality. So there are several limitations. I think the biggest one is, what is the right definition of PAD? And I don't think anyone in the community at the moment knows what that is. I can tell you for our group, we've got people who are building natural language processing tools to extract ABI, ankle brachial index, in order to help identify more people with PAD. One of the biggest problems is it's not readily diagnosed, and most people don't check for it. So for Josh Beckman, who is the senior author on this paper, who just moved from Harvard to Vanderbilt, who is a vascular medicine specialist, he said, if he had one word for this crowd, he goes, please just check a pulse on a person's foot. It sounds insane. Please do it. Most people don't. And the fact is that PAD often goes undiagnosed. And to give you a sense, if you, if you don't feel any pulses, just refer or get a simple thing of ankle brachial index. Those little things can make a big difference in these people's lives. Other limitations. When we stratified more mortality, those event, those those curves were not adjusted for time-updated CD4 and viral load. I've already showed you what happens when you compare baseline versus time-updated, and there can be differences in risk. And lastly, and unfortunately, our sample is overwhelmingly male, so I cannot comment on what this may mean as far as women infected with HIV. So to summarize, HIV infection is associated with an increased risk of PAD, at least in our cohort, after adjustment for potential confounders, including traditional risk factors. We found that people with lower CD4 and higher viral load are at a considerable increased risk, even in a time-updated analysis, and that PAD is a high-risk group. Mortality is common after this, regardless of HIV status, um, but more so for the people who are immunodeficient and um, not suppressed. A lot of people to acknowledge Amy Justice, the PI, the VAX, our collaborators, our contributors, the NIH, both NIAAA and NHLBI. And with that, I will stop and take any questions if you have them. Thank you very much for your time.
Hi, Omar Suet from Argentina. Congratulations, excellent, incredible sample size. Uh, maybe I missed, uh, but do you have information about statin use among this population? And perhaps you could have information in C cytomegalovirus serology or not in this cohort? Great question. So statin use, we haven't, we've found that if we just have a baseline statin variable, which is not included in our analysis, it wasn't profoundly helpful. And that knowing whether people take statins over time is probably what we need to know. And I don't have those data to know, but we are working on that. Um, the second question with regards to cytomegalovirus. So it's a really important question. One of the things our group's doing, but we don't have it in 90,000 people, but we're working with others. We have 2,500 of these participants now who, within the VAX, who have genomic screening, they have B cell, T cell, and monocyte screening to TH1, TH2, TH17, T regulatory cells, all three classes of monocyte. And to your point, we're working with John Curta and others to get CMV antibody and titer, H pylori, and other potential viral markers on top of that. Mm -hmm. And lastly, Somalogic has given us two and a half million dollars on top of our grant to do wow. proteomic networks. So they're giving us 4,000 proteins for all 2,300 people to look at protein networks to try to understand from the gene to the protein what's driving this. And those data are pending, but I hope that Thank helps a little bit. Much. You're welcome. Okay. I'm Nicolas Quillace from Italy. Okay. Uh, congratulations. Uh, any, two questions. Uh, did you find any association with uh, cumulative uh, antiretroviral drugs exposure and uh, with uh, duration of infection and CDC stage? So I think with regards to ART, we didn't look, we only did our analysis with baseline data and referred to focus on the viral load in CD4. When we looked at baseline, we only looked by class. We didn't look by individual meds like Abacavir. We didn't find a significant association, but without time updated data, I would not say that. And there's, as you know, plenty of data to link ARVs um, to the outcome, to a cardiovascular outcome. Can I ask you to repeat the second one real quick because I want to make sure I get it. Uh, is duration of HIV infection and the CDC stage? Yeah. So the duration of infection is really our Achilles heel and I'll tell you what I mean by that. You know, these people come into care, even when I have a CD4 count, I don't know how long they've had the virus, which really impacts the issue. But I'm going to make one plug for a, a cohort in a paper, if I can, that might get at this. So Brian Agan runs the Department of Defense cohort. Many people may or may not know it. But What's really important is they gave us blood before HIV infection in their participants. They gave us 250 people. We had blood before HIV, blood before ART, blood with viral suppression on two separate accounts. So every person was their own control. And they check every six months with active military. So we know when they got infected and they were suppressed within two years. When we did that, we found that their lipids didn't change, the anemia didn't change, renal function didn't change, liver didn't change, nothing changed except D-dimer did not go back to normal in these people, suggesting that even with 25-year-olds with no comorbid disease, as aggressively as you could treat, you still didn't get there. So coming back to some of the, what, you're, what you're saying, we, even when you have ideal situations, you still might not necessarily understand what's happening, and that's what we're trying to figure out. Does that help a little bit? Jenny. If I didn't, no, please, if I didn't, if I missed. No, 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 uh, it's okay. okay. <laughs> Hi, Jenny Hoy, Melbourne, Australia. Um, your cohort had an extraordinarily high smoking rate, mm -hmm. of over 50%. I wondered if you were able to look at smoking cessation <laughs> and PAD. So it's a great question. We can look, it's harder to look at smoking cessation in its entirety, meaning when we can have inpatient data and we can see some of the outpatient data, but because most smoking cessation therapy that our veterans use are over the counter and outside the system, it's hard to know how often they're taking it and continually taking it. My wife, who's in the audience, is actually a smoking cessation expert um, at Vanderbilt. So we are looking at it because Steve Grinspoon had a paper in the New England Journal. Um, it was a review article that looked at the Framingham risk score. If you got people to cut their smoking out and left everything high, their, their absolute risk of greater than 20 dropped to less than 10% if you didn't touch any of the other risk factors. So there's no question it's important. It's how do you track it. And the other piece I'll say on top of it is, while nicotine replacement is common, drugs like varenicline and outside your cytosine are drugs that aren't used as often, but the efficacy for cessation is greater. And because the new EAGLES trial, for those of you who don't know, looking at varenicline and mental health disorders and didn't find 
the increased risk of suicidality and other mental health things, I think you'll start seeing that being used. But it's hard to track for the reasons we said. We don't have all the data. Quick, quick question, uh, Matthew. You mentioned the mortality, relation with all-cause mortality. Have you, are, are you planning to look at incident coronary artery disease and stroke? Yes. The only problem with death data, if we want to look at, if you're asking like specific cause of death data, is that death certificates aren't very reliable. So what we've done, we have a protocol with sudden cardiac death, which we've done, but we're going into the charts and trying to look at the last clinic note that we could see. And if, if it's within a certain time frame that they were seen, and that may help us do that, but it's still limited. We've asked our colleagues at the Framingham Heart Study for their protocols and advice, but they even admit that it's limited. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our third speaker is Dominique costa Liola from France. She's a senior researcher at the INSERM and head of the Pierre-Louis Institute of Epidemiology and Public Health at Sorbonne Universities, INSERM and UPMC. Good afternoon, and I hope you enjoy the conference and your stay in Paris. And as far as popery is concerned, it just meant a mixture of different elements and it looks like it's coming from a British tradition, so that's the best of my knowledge about it. <laughs> so here are my disclosures. What do we know about bone in person living with HIV? We know that person living with HIV have a lower bone mineral density as compared to the general population of same age and sex. And we also know that the incidence of fracture is higher compared to the general population. From randomized clinical trials in naive patients, we've learned that bone mineral density decreases when initiating antiretroviral treatment, in particular after exposure to tenofovir and to PIs. However, several recent studies suggest that for PIs, where the decrease is observed only at spine, it might be an artifact linked with an increase in visceral fat and not a true one. Finally, we also know from the SMART trials that BMD increases when stopping antiretroviral therapy. In terms of exposure to specific antiretroviral drugs and the risk of fractures, a seven studies have been conducted, six cohort study and one case control study, and they differ widely in which kind of fracture they consider, either they consider um, all the fracture, or only low energy fracture, or only fractures at osteoporotic site. And they also differ in the type of confounders they accounted for, and very few accounted for the traditional risk factor of fractures. And when you consider all the seven studies, and for those who have analyzed both fracture and fracture at osteoporotic site, if you consider only of osteoporotic site, uh, it turns out that only one study found an, an, an increased risk of fracture with exposure to tenofovir. One concluded that the risk is increased, but when you look at the confidence interval, it's not significant. One found a decreased risk with longer exposure to, to tenofovir, and four found no association for PI. One found an increased, non but it was not significant risk, one found an association, but the conclusion of the author was that it was not necessarily causal, and so we didn't find any association. With this in, in mind, we wanted to assess the potential impact of exposure to each drug on the risk of low energy fracture located at possible osteoporotic site, with a special insight on PIs and on tenofovir exposure. And for this, we conducted a co case control study nested within the French hospital database on HIV, and we restricted our analysis to patients enrolled in the database while naive of ARV in order to avoid any selection bias linked with uh, treatment history. The study was funded by INRS and by the French Drug Agency, and the protocol and the analysis plan were pre-specified. Cases where individuals enrolled in the database while naive, as I said, with the first prospectively re reported low energy fracture at a possible site of osteoporotic fracture occurring between 2000 and 2010. 
and the possible osteoporotic sites are listed on the slide. And for low energy fracture, we use the international definition and we ask the participant to complete a questionnaire to describe the circumstance of the fracture. And this was reviewed by a specialist in order to determine whether or not it was a low energy fracture. Controls were randomly selected using incidence density sampling among individuals enrolled in the database while I have been naive. After matching on sex, age, HIV diagnosis period, clinical center, and the fact of being followed at the time of the fracture in the corresponding case. All medical records of cases and control were reviewed to validate data from the database and to collect additional data on fracture risk factor when they are not collected in the database. And the factors that we consider were those which are included in the FRAX, uh, fracture equation risk, uh, which are widely recognized. Uh, some elements of the flow chart. Uh, out of the above 60,000 patients enrolled while naive and followed between 2000 and 2010 in the database, uh, 1,026 1, had a, at least one fracture reported. We could access medical records of 861 and found that 261 were eligible with the definition that we use. And we were able to match at least one control to 254 of them, leaving us with a study size of 254 cases matched to 376 controls. And the median year of fracture was 2007. And with this sample size, the type of relative risk that we are able to assess would be relative risk above 1.6, from 1.6 to 2.0 at the minimum with a reasonable power. In terms of statistical analysis, we compare the characteristic of case and control using appropriate uh, con conditional logistic regression. For risk factors, missing value were inputted using multiple imputation techniques. And we model the exposure to each anti viral by three different ways. The first one was cumulative exposure, that's model one. Exposure, yes or no, that's model two. And in a third model, for each drug, we choose the, the one we model the, the exposure fracture relationship the best by selecting uh, with ICAI criterion either cumulative exposure or exposure, yes or no. And it turns out that for most antiretroviral drugs, um, the selected exposure method was yes, no, except for efavirenz, atazanavir, darunavir, fosampronavir, and FTC. For some drugs which were uncommon in uh, controls, less than 10% of controls were using them, we do account for exposure to those variables, but do not report the result because we feel uh, it's too uncertain. All exposure variables and potential confounders, that is known risk factor of fractures and HIV related factors, differences in cases and control, were included in multivariable models. So, some element of description case where 49 years of age at time of fractures, two thirds were men, and above 70% had been diagnosed prior to the CRTR, showing uh, a long time of HIV infection. Uh, they, are more likely, they were more likely to be MSM, one third, and less likely to be sub, from sub-Saharan origin, and this also in, in French context uh, relates to uh, a, a long time of infection and the early days of the epidemic. In terms of HIV parameters, there was not much difference between cases and control. Uh, with case uh, having a controlled viral load and uh, a CD4 above uh, 400, an ADS CD4 of 172, and the only difference was that cases were more likely to have had an AIDS defining condition, again, a sign of long term infection. In terms of fracture risk factors, cases were more likely to be underweight, 13% versus 6 more likely to drink more than two glasses a day, 24% versus 13, 
more likely to have had prior exposure to glucocorticoid, 10% versus 4, and more likely to have known osteoporosis. Here are the results. So I present the result of modern one. Remember, it's cumulative exposure, either univariable or with adjustment on other exposure to antiretroviral drugs and confounders. Model two, exposure yes, no, and model three. For tenofovir, either in univariable analysis or multivariable analysis, whether it's model one, model two, or model three, we didn't find any significant association. For PIs, our second uh, main question, we didn't find any significant association apart from atazanavir, for which we found a significant association in both univariable and multivariable model one, univariable model one but not multivariable model one, and not in model three where atazanavir were also modeled as cumulative exposure. So an, an association but not consistent across the different ways of modeling exposure. When we consider first generation PIs, that is all PI except atazanavir or derenavir, or all PI's exposure, we didn't find any significant association. What about the other drugs? For NRTIs, we didn't find any significant association in multivariable models. For efavirenz, however, we found that cumulative exposure to efavirenz was associated with a slightly lower risk of fracture, only in adjusted model one and three, but not in univariable model or in model two. To further explore this association, we ran a pre-specified sensitivity analysis where exposure to efavirenz was modeled as no exposure less than two years more than two years. You can note first that uh, relatively few, only 14% of cases, had been exposed to efavirenz for more than two years. And when uh, running the analysis this way, you find that neither exposure of less than two years nor exposure of more than two years were found to be significantly associated with the risk of fracture. To conclude, as for any observational studies, observed association must be interpreted with caution. And I, I want to remind you that I studied low energy fracture at possible osteoporotic site, which was not necessarily the case in previous studies. In our studies, there was no evidence of excess risk of fracture following exposure to tenofovir or to PIs. And it's fair to say that most published studies did not report an increased risk of fracture associated with exposure to tenofovir or to PIs, as I showed you in my introductory slides. For PI, the result is not unexpected if the association with bone mineral density at spine only is an artifact. For tenofovir, trials have shown a differential impact on bone mineral density when initiating with tenofovir, but there are few data on the tenofovir impact in patients treated for many years. And interestingly, in two recently published studies, one in Europe, one in the United States, where in which they compared change in bone mineral density over time in HIV-infected and HIV-uninfected individuals, they didn't find any difference between the two groups, and they found no relationship with exposure to tenofovir apart from the initial period of initiation. And in our study, only 9% of the 49% which had been exposed to tenofovir were exposed to tenofovir as a first antiretroviral regimen. We think that this is an important result, the fact that we didn't find any association with tenofovir in the current debate in high-income countries about TAF versus generic tenofovir. For efavirenz, as I've shown you, uh, the result is not robust because all ways of modeling exposure and we don't consider it to be causal. I would like to finish by thanking all the study participants and all the clinical sites that participated in the study. Thank you.
Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. So it's a pleasure to introduce the next speaker who um, is from Amsterdam, Marje Dijkstra, who is a PhD student at the Municipal Health Service in Amsterdam and in her spare time decided to do an analysis in the cohort study that I run on aging. So I want to personally thank you, Marje, for doing that and showing the results here. Well, Go ahead. Th thank you, Peter, and of course, thank you for conducting this study and providing the data. Um, so let's talk about sex. Um, I think we've been talking about a lot about sex at this conference because it's difficult not to talk about sex when you talk about HIV. Um, but we've been mostly talking about sex as a risk or as a potential, um, something dangerous. Um, and I think sometimes we forget, um, or hopefully we don't, but we don't really talk about it, that sex is also something you should enjoy. Um, so um, I want to talk about that and um, how it is um, to have sex as an HIV-infected individual. So I have no conflicts of interest. Um, so some studies have reported um, that uh, people living with HIV have a higher prevalence of sexual dysfunction, uh, but usually these studies did not include um, a nice control group. And also there have been inconsistent reports about um, protease inhibitors and um, their effects on sexual functioning. So that leads me to my research questions. Um, so we wanted to know um, whether HIV status was independently associated with decreased sexual functioning. Uh, among MSM who were at least 45 years of age uh, and of whom the majority was receiving CARD. And if so, if that was true, what are risk factors for decreased sexual functioning? So uh, as Peter said, we use data from the HIV cohort study, which is, which is a prospective comparative cohort study. It's ongoing um, and it's aiming to investigate the association between um, HIV status and uh, long-term comorbidities, HSA-associated comorbidities. Um, the study started in 2010, um, and at baseline, 550 HIV uninfected participants were included and um, almost 600 HIV infected participants. Uh, they were all uh, 45 years or older, um, and um, they visit um, the clinic every two years, um, and then um, standardized assessments of comorbidities, medication use, and depression and frailty uh, are being conducted. Um, so for this analysis, um, we use data from, uh, from all MSM included in this study, all men over sex with men, um, which was, were almost 400 uh, HIV negative uh, MSM and almost 400 HIV positive MSM. Um, we used baseline data, uh, so it's a cross-sectional analysis, uh, and we used all the important risk factors. <laughs> Um, so the study questionnaire included three questions on um, um, sexual functioning, representing three sexual domains. So the three domains were uh, sexual satisfaction, um, sexual desire, and erectile function. And every um, question um, had a, a score ranging from one to five, and a lower score meant worse sexual functioning. Um, and what we did is we dichotomized those three questions um, and a score of two or lower meant uh, decreased sexual uh, functioning on that specific domain. Um, so we had three outcomes, um, and we, so we constructed multivariable logistic regression models, including all MSM in the study. Um, and first, we explored in univariable analysis all factors uh, known from literature which were associated with HIV and sexual dysfunction. And it's very difficult in these type of analysis to, um, to distangle uh, whether something is um, um, a mediator or a confounder. So we had a stepwise approach um, to our multivariable models. First, we only adjusted for demographic characteristics, uh, and then we adjusted um, for all variables that were associated with HIV and one of the three um, sexual domains. Uh, I will show you that in a bit. Um, and then we wanted to look a bit deeper into the um, HIV and CARD-related variables, and uh, for that we included only the HIV-infected MSM. So very briefly, this is what our cohort uh, looked like. Uh, the median age is around uh, 53 years. Uh, the vast majority, 95%, is using CARDs, and of those, um, the 97% um, um, is virally suppressed. Um, here I'm showing the prevalence of um, decreased sexual functioning on each domain. As I said, there's three, three domains, and as you can see, for all three uh, domains, um, decreased um, sexual functioning was more prevalent in the HIV-infected group. Um, and the difference is most pronounced um, for decreased erectile function. Um, so here I'm showing the, um, 
um, association between HIV status and decreased sexual functioning on each domain. Um, first, we're looking at decreased satisfaction. Um, so this is the unadjusted odds ratio. Um, then we adjust it for age and ethnicity, not so much happens. And then we fully adjust it for all variables that were associated, like I said, with HIV in at least one of the three domains. Um, and they included waist to hip ratio, comorbidities, depression, frailty, and medication use. And as you can see, HIV status is no longer significantly associated um, with decreased satisfaction. Well, we saw a very similar pattern for uh, decreased desire when we fully adjusted. Um, but as said before, uh, the difference um, between HIV positive and HIV negative was most pronounced for decreased erectile function. And even when we fully adjusted, um, there was still a significant and strong association between HIV status and decreased erectile function. So we wanted to look a little bit deeper into that. So what, what is happening in those HIV-infected MSM uh, and what about their erectile function? Um, so we constructed uh, multivariable models in which we included only HIV-infected MSM. Um, we adjusted only for frailty and number of age-related comorbidities, and that was because we had a limited number of outcomes. And so we just um, we did a backward selection on our final model um, in the full population, and these were the two variables which were most important uh, as confounders. Uh, we found no association for a number of um, uh, HIV-related variables, uh, but we did find a borderline significant association for time spent as a low uh, CD4 count. Uh, and when, when we looked at drug classes, uh, the specific ARVs, uh, we saw that cumulative um, PI use was associated with decreased erectile function. Um, and as I said before in my introduction, um, the literature has been inconsistent uh, on that. So we wanted to look a bit deeper into that. Um, so we added um, the ARVs one by one to our model. Uh, as said, they were all adjusted for frailty and number of age-related comorbidities. And first we looked at prior exposure. Um, so people who used a specific PI in the past but had stopped it now. Um, so we didn't see so much happening. Uh, but then we looked at current exposure. Um, and as you can see, um, current use of ritonavir and uh, lopinavir uh, calitra um, were both strongly significantly associated with decreased erectile function. Um, we thought, well, maybe this is confounding by indication. Um, so we adjusted for um, time since HIV diagnosis and uh, longer time spent at a low CD4 count. Not so much happened. Uh, and I think, as you all know, um, um, lopinavir is always um, boosted by ritonavir, uh, but ritonavir uh, can also boost a different PI. Um, so we, we wanted to see maybe we can, uh, which of these components contribute most to uh, decreased erectile function. So we added both variables in the same model, and I think what you see is, is very interesting. Um, the association for ritonavir completely disappeared, um, and the association for Calitra uh, remained very um, significant. Well, of course, we have some limitations. Um, we did not use a standardized qu uh, questionnaire to assess uh, sexual dysfunction. Actually, we included that in the, in the current study visit, so hopefully we'll have some data on that uh, in, in one or two years. Um, we also didn't assess hypogonadism in our cohort, um, and um, this has been associated um, with HIV status and may influence also uh, sexual health. And furthermore, we also did not assess um, any psychological factors other than impression. So, for example, being afraid of passing HIV on to, to a partner, uh, which of course also might influence um, sexual health. So, to conclude, uh, we found a higher prevalence of um, decreased sexual satisfaction and decreased sexual desire, and we think we can explain this by a higher pre prevalence of depression, frailty, and comorbidities. Uh, we also found um, an independent association between HIV and decreased erectile function um, and in this specific HIV-infected population. Uh, we found that current exposure to Calitra um, appears to be an independent risk factor for decreased erectile function. So I think the take-home message is uh, not only feel the pulse of your uh, patients, but also talk about sex. Um, of course, uh, I would like to thank some people, um, people who helped collecting the data, the nurses and the doctors, um, and of course also the participants. Thank you. Okay. The presentation open for questions. Stefan. Stefan de Wit Brussels. Thank you for reminding us to talk about sex. Uh, 
One question, did you adjust for condom use in the two groups and potentially use of chemsex in the two groups? No, no, I did not. It's actually a good suggestion. We did look uh, a bit at that in the beginning uh, when it was still very explorative. Um, we didn't see uh, so much happening, so we, de we decided actually to, uh, to not include it. Um, but at a later stage, I, I didn't look at it anymore. So um, we might go back to the data and it's a good suggestion. Thank you. Hello, Omar Suez from Argentina. Congratulations. Uh, this is an, a drug effect from Caletra, or is a drug interaction with hormone metabolism? Like, uh, I mean, Caletra has demonstrated to produce or induce gynecomastia. And so, could you or you will be able to perform uh, testosterone levels or hormone levels in this population to dis discriminate if it's the drug or is the other condition associated to HIV status? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a very good suggestion. I think um, because at the moment we are assessing um, sexual dysfunction in a standardized way in our questionnaire, and I think this would be also a good moment to, to assess testosterone levels. Uh, we didn't do that before, uh, also because this was more explorative, um, and I think it's definitely uh, something we should yeah. do in the future. And testosterone replacement use also, probably. Is necessary. Yes, we did look at that, um, but this was actually a very small proportion uh, of our population, and we did a um, sensitivity analysis in, we, in which we excluded all participants who reported the use of testosterone. Um, but since it was a, such a small uh, fraction, uh, it didn't make any difference. And you have the proportion of people using sildenafil or something like that? Yes, and also. Yeah, also. Yeah, we also excluded them in a sensitivity analysis. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. Uh, Tom Campbell from the uh, University of Colorado. So, uh, other comorbidities like diabetes and peripheral vascular disease yeah. are, are associated. So were those adjusted for in your analysis? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, so we, started, we decided to uh, include a composition. Um, so number of comorbidities present and uh, all, all of them were validated. Um, uh, so they were either measured at uh, study visits or uh, they were validated with, with someone's GP, for example, or with clinical records. Uh, and we uh, at a um, variable included 10 comorbidities, so diabetes, cardiovascular, uh, non-associated cancer. Okay, question here in the uh, center. Paul in Los Angeles. Uh, among the comorbidities, did you also consider peripheral neuropathy? Um, we did not measure that. Uh, um, did we? Maybe you know, Peter. Which yeah. comorbidity did you mention? Peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy. I'm not sure whether we've recorded that. I don't think we have data on that, actually, but it's, it's a very good suggestion, of course. Yeah, yeah. See any further questions? Okay, thank you very much, Martin. <laughs> so the next presenter is uh, Dr. Nitya Srinivas, who is a third year PhD student at the University of North Carolina. And I'm actually particularly happy to introduce her because she just received one of the IAS ANRS Lange van Tongeren Awards and, and Joop Lange and Jacqueline van Tongeren were close friends and colleagues of mine and would have been very proud of you. The topic of your uh, talk is uh, SHIV infection and drug transporters influence brain tissue concentrations of efavirenz. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I want to thank the uh, moderators and the organizers for giving us this opportunity to present our work here today. So to give you some background on this project and HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, or HAND, it's a spectrum of neurocognitive deficit caused due to HIV infection. And as you can see, there are varying levels of severity from an asymptomatic decline in cognition, or ANI, all the way up to dementia associated with HIV. Now, before heart, almost 60% of patients would develop HAD in the progressed stage of AIDS before death. However, since heart, there have been several initiatives to characterize the extent of HAD prevalence or hand prevalence uh, in cohorts such as Charter. And since heart, as you can see for HAD, the prevalence has dropped to about 2 to 5%. However, what's surprising is the milder forms of neurocognitive impairment particularly ANI, are as high as 20 to 50%. So 
An obvious question is why does hand continue to persist despite therapy? So there are some reasons postulated for this. One is an irreversible CNS injury caused even before initiating treatment. This is often called a legacy effect, or inadequate control of a persistent infection due to not enough drug penetration into the brain, or finally neurotoxicity due to the antiretroviral medication itself. As clinical pharmacologists, we tend to be interested in factors relating to concentration of drug, and. To highlight this point in particular, I like this figure,、uh, which is a theoretical model proposed by Dr. Scott Latondra, wherein he says that the risk of neurocognitive impairment could be a function of the antiretroviral drug concentration in the central nervous system. So, if you have low drug concentration in the CNS, you might have a higher risk of impairment due to immune activation and uncontrolled replication. When your Concentration increases, you get into this clinically cognitive threshold where risk is low. However, too high drug concentration, and you might have a neurotoxicity effect. While this is an interesting concept,、uh, we'd be interested in actually having these PK measurements of antiretrovirals in the CNS to see if we can derive a PKPD relationship. And in this regard, when we Talk about measuring antiretroviral PK in CNS. Usually, CSF、uh, concentrations of antiretrovirals are measured by a lumbar puncture. And the table that I've shown here is the only known available data for antiretroviral concentration in human brains.、Uh, this was presented at Croy two years ago, and it's compared to historical CSF concentrations. So for the most part, you can see that for all antiretrovirals, brain concentrations seem to be higher than the CSF, and this is particularly、uh, noted for tenofovir.、Uh, going more into、uh, how the drug would get into the brain, this is an illustration of the free drug hypothesis, where the unbound drug moves from plasma into CSF and brain by traversing membranes. Therefore, if you measure an unbound drug at CSF, it should serve as surrogate for brain tissue concentrations. However, this relationship is complicated by the fact that there are several drug transporters present at the various membranes, such as BCRP and PGP. Since antiretrovirals tend to be substrates for these transporters, the relationship between CSF and brain concentration might be a little bit more complex. So, taking all of this into mind, we decided to perform this preliminary analysis in rhesus macaques. Wherein we measure the concentration of six antiretrovirals in brain tissue and CSF for both uninfected and SHIV-infected animals. We also measure the concentration of two efflux transporters, BCRP and PGP, by a Q-tap technique in brain. And finally, we wanted to determine the effect of SHIV infection and drug transporters on the brain tissue concentrations. So to go over the methods,、uh, on the left are the various antiretroviral drugs that we studied in this analysis, as well as the drug transporter interactions. You can see that, except for amitriptyline, most of these drugs are known substrates for either PG or PGP or BCRP. On the right are the various parts of the brain、uh, that we studied.、Uh, from the cerebrum, we looked at the parietal and frontal lobes, the basal ganglia, as well as the cerebellum. So we looked at rhesus macaques, a total of 12,、uh, both uninfected and infected with SHIV. All animals received a backbone of tenofovir and amitriptyline, with either mirabiroc and atazanavir, or efavirenz and raltegravir. The animals were dosed for 10 days with、uh, standard dosing regimens,、uh, approximating clinical dosing. Drugs were measured by LCMS-MS in the CSF and brain tissue, and statistical analysis was by Crisco Walls test. And the drug transporters are measured by a Q-tap technique. In brief, the、uh, brain tissue sample was homogenized, and the protein was digested. And the peptides for BCRP and PGP were、uh, quantified using radiolabeled ligands. And we、uh, looked at the differences in transporter concentration with the t-test. So. Looking at our results, what I have here are antiretroviral drug concentrations in the various、uh, parts of the brain, and you can see that there doesn't really seem to be any differences between the antiretroviral concentration in any of the brain parts. Therefore, moving forward in this analysis, we took an average brain tissue concentration、uh, from all four sites. 
Now, looking at the CSF and brain tissue concentrations of antiretrovirals in these macaques, uh, the gray represents uninfected, red is infected, and the lighter shades are CSF, the darker is brain tissue. To go through the results, for tenofovir, emtricitabine, and efavirenz, brain tissue concentrations were significantly higher than the CSF. For raltegravir, moravirac, and adazanavir, while there does definitely appear to be a trend of higher brain tissue concentrations, this relationship was not significant, and this might be due to a small n. What was particularly interesting is, in case of efavirenz, uh, there was a significant lower concentration of efavirenz in infected brain tissue as compared to the uninfected. To look more closely between the correlation for antiretroviral PK in the cerebrospinal fluid and brain tissue, we performed correlation analysis where brain concentrations on the Y and CSF on the X. For most of these antiretrovirals, it appears that there is a high correlation between CSF and brain. However, this is usually driven by this one point, which actually came from one macaque, which had an abnormally high brain tissue distribution. However, if you look at efavirenz, we saw a strong correlation throughout the curve between CSF and brain. Then, looking at the efflux transporter concentration, stratified by SHIV infection, we saw that for animals infected with SHIV, there was a two-fold higher concentration of BCRP. However, there was no significant difference in the PGP concentration. Putting all this information together, we wanted to look at the brain concentration as a function of BCRP concentration by QTAP. So we performed this linear, linear regression analysis. And for most of these drugs, you can see there's really nothing uh, going on. There's just a lot of background. However, in case of efavirenz, the infected brain tissue concentrations kind of grouped together, and the uninfected grouped separately, and lower brain concentration does seem to be associated with a higher BCRP concentration. Of course, this wasn't significant, and that might possibly be due to our small sample size, which is a great segue into the limitations of this analysis, um, the small sample size for several of our drugs. And we are actually analyzing more macaque brain tissue samples, uh, so we hope to rectify this. Also. We did not measure exposure of drug in the brain over the dosing interval. That might have been a more accurate measure than the trough concentrations. Finally, we only measured efflux transporters in this analysis. But as you can see from this table, antiretroviral drugs show interaction with several influx transporters as well as metabolizing enzymes. So uh, it would be nice to have had the effect of several other factors here as well. To summarize, the brain tissue concentrations were shown to be significantly higher than CSF for efavirenz, emtricitabine, and tenofovir. CSF concentrations were only predictive of brain tissue concentrations for efavirenz. The brain tissue concentration of efavirenz were fourfold higher in the uninfected animals, and BCRP protein concentrations were twofold lower in uninfected animals. There was a trend noted between increasing concentrations of BCRP protein and low efavirenz concentration in brain tissue. So to draw a broad conclusion, lower concentrations of efavirenz in brain tissue was shown to occur with SHIV infection. And, you know, we think that the upregulation of BCRP transporter protein may contribute to this effect. I talked about hand in the beginning of this presentation, and I wanted to circle back to, uh, to that now and what we think this data means. Um, so what I have here is the total uh, concentrations of efavirenz in the darker shades uh, that we measured in brain tissue. And considering the high protein binding of efavirenz, about 99.8% in brain tissue, we predicted what the free drug concentrations would be. And as you can see for the infected macaques, free drug concentration of efavirenz is just above the IC50 and even below IC90. So, Considering, again, this model proposed by Dr. Latondra, what we believe is going on for efavirenz is that we might just have low drug concentration in the central nervous system. So for perhaps for patients on efavirenz-based therapies, the persistence of hand might be because of the low concentration of drug. And what we hope to do is also look at this in a cohort of HIV patients and test this hypothesis uh, to see if it holds true. 
I would like to make a lot of acknowledgments uh, to my C4C PAC lab, in particular my advisor, Dr. Kashuba, and other collaborators on the study. I want to thank all members of my dissertation committee and my funding sources. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Open for questions. Yes, central microphone. Uh, Pim Raj from uh, the National Institutes of Mental Health. So I'm very interested in your effervorance uh, 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 data. As you may know, particularly of people just starting effervorance, there are very often central nervous system manifestations that are more in the psychiatric domain. So I was wondering, in your uninfected uh, macaque, that actually seem to have incredibly high uh, um, concentrations, did you notice any behavioral manifestations in these animals? Did they start to behave uh, more manic or something like that? Um, no, I don't think we saw that in the macaques. Um, I, would, I would say that uh, we've also looked at these brain concentrations for the uh, humanized mice as well, and we don't even dose efavirenz for uh, the BLT mice because they show the exact same behavior. They, they kind of act um, spacey. Uh, but for these particular macaques, we, we did not see that. Thank you. Question on the right. Um, great data and congratulations on your well-deserved award. Thank you. Uh, you. You're lucky to be working in, um, <clears throat> in macaques. So I do have a question because we, are, we just started a study looking at hand um, in HIV-affected adults in Uganda. Um, we literally just um, have 14 patients enrolled. But one of the questions that we are, one of the things we are, grappling with is um, the reason for, um, for the relatively low uptake of the drug. What seems like lower concentration in the central nervous system of, say, um, effavirenz? It, could it be that you have much higher levels of neuroinflammation so that um, that might be counteracting the efficacy of the drug? I, and I wonder whether um, in your macaque samples you're able to have some correlation between neuroinflammation markers and um, levels of the drug. Um, and if you could help us with, and look at, since we don't have access to human brains easily, <laughs> if you can help us actually see if there's some systemic correlations um, about what systemic inflammatory marker might correlate with neuroinflammatory marker, that would be interesting. But your thoughts in general would be good. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, human brain tissue samples, they're, they're, and human humans with hand, they're hard to come by uh, with these studies. Um, so... I think inflammation could play a part. I'm not exactly sure because we have, uh, we're actually performing um, immunohistochemistry analysis with these samples and also uh, looking at certain inflammatory markers. We haven't finished that analysis yet. But, you know, there are those uh, obvious players like NF uh, neurofilm and light chain uh, that people have uh, said have been associated at least with systemic concentrations. I, I think that... You know, if you're looking at the low drug concentrations here, you know, we looked at this uh, transporter effect, but I think it, it might be more uh, complex than that because especially if you're looking at acute infection, there's this, you know, ongoing inflammation that happens. And, you know, also if you look at, you know, protein concentrations, right, then you can see the leakiness of the barrier and that, because with the inflammation, what happens is, you know, even the there's disintegra disintegration of the blood-brain barrier. So, um, I, I, I think that the uh, low concentrations here, we are definitely going to try to see if we can correlate with the uh, neurocognitive markers. What we have seen so far is we could definitely see the infiltration of some of the cells, such as the macrophages and monocytes, in our brain tissue samples. So that's kind of encouraging. And what we're also going to do is, uh, beyond the inflammatory, we're going to also look at metabolites of efavirenz because the 8-hydroxy, the 7-hydroxy, they're even more potent neurotoxins than efavirenz itself, and that might contribute. And that's also a reasoning behind why, even if you have low efavirenz concentrations, you still see neurotoxicity in these patients. So uh, all things that I'd love to explore in, in the coming analysis. Okay, I have one final question for you. Do you have any thoughts on how Schiff may upregulate the, the transporter? Or any conceptual thoughts? Uh, so, um, the, like, so for HIV, I know that uh, there's been some studies where they've shown the 
TAT protein to uh, contribute to the upregulation of MRP4. This is also shown for PGP. So it might be a mechanism similar to that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure of what the exact mechanism is, though. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our final talk in the session will be given by uh, Professor Andrew Carr from St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, who is also a long-standing friend and colleague. I guess we're both getting old, uh, Andrew. Uh, and Andrew will be speaking on the use of zoledronic acid as being superior to uh, TDF switching for increasing bone mineral density in HIV-infected adults with osteopenia, and it's a randomized trial. The floor is yours. Um, thanks very much, Peter. Um, either you get older or you don't, I suppose. So. Um. Hmm. Ah, very good. Uh, so thanks to the uh, abstract committee for selecting this for presentation. Um, thanks to all my colleague co-authors um, who've done so much of the work here. Uh, they're my potential conflicts of interest over the last couple of years. Uh, so by way of background, um, tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, or TDF, uh, has been shown in several randomised clinical trials to lower bone mineral density. Uh, TDF has also been associated in some, but not all, studies with an increased uh, risk of fracture. Uh, low bone mineral density in HIV-infected adults improves with one of two interventions. Either you can switch the TDF, and there's multiple trials showing that switching to a bacavir, uh, an integrase inhibitor, or since the, we performed this trial, studies showing switching to TAF or to, in fact, no nucleosides have all been shown uh, to improve uh, bone mineral density over a one to two year period. Likewise, bisphosphonate therapy has been shown uh, to improve bone mineral density, and of course, bone, uh, bisphosphonates not only improve the surrogate marker, but in HIV uninfected adults, uh, reduce fracture incidence. And two of the more commonly used ones, which are the only two to be studied in patients with HIV, are zoledronic acid and alendronate. Importantly, which of these two strategies is superior unknown, is unknown. Uh, the numerical increases, which I'll come back to, do appear greater with a bisphosphonate, uh, which seems a bit uh, odd given that the vast number of trials that have looked at this issue have actually looked at the switching option. So we hypothesised that bisphosphonate therapy with solidronic acid would increase bone mineral density more effectively over two years than switching TDF to another antiretroviral drug. The primary outcome was the mean percentage change in lumbar spine bone mineral density, so that's L1 to L4 BMD, by dual energy X-ray absorbed geometry, or DEXA. We chose the spine in preference to the hip because measurement of the lumbar spine BMD and hip BMD have similar variability, but the lumbar spine BMD responds more rapidly to pharmaceutical interventions than does hip BMD, which allows you to do a shorter study. So the inclusion criteria, uh, participants had to be adults on stable antiretroviral therapy, including TDF, for at least the prior six months. They had to have an undetectable viral load for at least the prior three months. And because half the population was going to continue on TDF, they had to have a GFR of above 60. They all had to have osteopenia, which was defined by a T-score of at least minus one or lower at uh, either the spine or the left femoral neck uh, by DEXA. And of course, they, because half were going to switch, they had no prior virological failure, resistance, intolerance, or contraindication to the proposed switch drug. So for example, if somebody might switch to a Bacavir, they, had, they could not be HLA-B5701 positive uh, or have prior cardiovascular disease. Exclusion criteria included the prior use of a bisphosphonate, the use of TDF for pre previously active chronic hepatitis B, uh, the actual clinical need for uh, BMD therapy for a bisphosphonate, such as a fragility fracture, various secondary causes of osteoporosis, which were hypogonadism, hypothyroidism, 
hyperparathyroidism, inhaled fluticasone in a patient on ritonavir, or prednisolone of at least 7.5 milligrams daily. There are a small number of contraindications to zoledronic acid, which include hypocalcemia, uveitis, uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty about the recent or planned major dental surgery, so as a precaution, that was also a, an exclusion. Lastly, concurrent use of a nephrotoxin, breastfeeding or pregnancy were also exclusion criteria. It was a randomised open-label two-year trial. Eligible participants were allocated to either zoledronic acid 5 milligrams intravenously at month 0 and at month 12, and these participants continued TDF, or participants switched TDF to an alternative antiretroviral and did not receive zoledronic acid. The switch drug or drugs was chosen prior to randomisation and, and randomisation was stratified by the radiology facility because it was done in three cities and also by the T-score. All participants received supplemental, supplemental calcium, 1500 milligrams a day, and vitamin D was replaced for two reasons. Firstly, to hopefully promote BMD increase and also to prevent the rare hypocalcemia that can occasionally be seen with zoledronic acid infusions. Therefore, if the, at screening at a month 11, if your vitamin D level was less than 25, indicating uh, a very low level, people received 100,000 units of vitamin D orally, which was two tablets. If the level was between 25 and 50, the participants received 50,000 units or one tablet. For all the above patients, if the vitamin D level was still less than 50 after three months, because levels take some time to increase, they then received 50,000 units monthly uh, thereafter. And the zoledronic acid was given at least two weeks after the vitamin D replacement uh, because of the hypocalcemia issue. As mentioned, bone mineral density was measured by DEXA at the lumbar spine and the left hip. There were three facilities in Sydney, Melbourne and Barcelona, all used a common protocol. There was central adjustment of the BMD values for longitudinal and cross-sectional consistency based on phantom scans. BMD results were not available to uh, the sites until each individual participant had reached month 24, unless there was a minimal trauma fracture, a BMD decline of at least 5%, or a new T-score less than minus 2.5, which of course is indicative of osteoporosis. The sample size was based on the prior mean changes uh, obscene, seen in the bisphosphonate or switch studies, which was 6.1% and 1% respectively. So assuming a slightly smaller delta of 4% and a higher SD that had been shown in any of the previous studies of 6%, the sample size becomes 36 per group assuming loss to follow-up of 15% over the two years to strategy or to follow-up, it becomes 42 per group. Uh, DEXA and lab parameters were, uh, between groups were compared with TEAST tests, categorical data were compared with Fisher's exact test or chi square test as appropriate. All the data I'll show you are intention to treat, but the per-protocol analyses yielded very, very similar results. So here's the consort chart, 109 screened to 87 randomised. The 22 not randomised were mostly ineligible because of a bone density that was too high. Two of the switch participants revoked their consent, which meant that 43 received, received zoledronic acid and 42 switched uh, TDF. In the zoledronic acid group at the top, there were three people uh, who didn't complete the study. Uh, one died, one moved, one was lost to follow-up, and additional three who ceased TDF in addition to receiving their zoledronic acid. In the switch group, the predominant switches were the switch to a Bacavir or to an integrase inhibitor. Four of these switch participants restarted TDF, but none of them received zoledronate. All of the participants were analysed. In terms of baseline characteristics, they're about 50 years of age, they're virtually all men, and about three quarters were white. With normal CD4 counts, a mean TDF duration at baseline of about six years. And given that uh, ritonavir can increase TDF concentrations, 
uh, it was good to see that there was a similar proportion of just over 20 per cent receiving a boosted PI. Uh, here are the uh, mean T-score, median, I should say, T-score data uh, for the two groups uh, of around the minus 1.5 mark at the sp spine and left hip. In terms of vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency, about 15% uh, had deficiency and another 40% had insufficiency. So here's the primary endpoint, the change in lumbar spine with the changes in zoledronate shown in yellow and the change in the switch group shown in white. Uh, and it's fairly obvious that there's a, at the two year mark, there's a 4.4% difference between the two groups, which was uh, highly statistically significant. Uh, when we went back to look at the month 12 data, uh, it was already significant at that time point. Uh, a few other observations were uh, most of the zoledronate effect seemed to occur with the first dose and much less with the second dose, uh, whereas with the switch, all the improvement appeared to be in the first year. If we look at the hip data with the femoral neck data on the left and the total hip data on the right, the results are very similar, uh, with uh, the differences uh, strongly favouring the zoledronate group most of the effect with both interventions seen in the first year. Um, as a secondary endpoint, of course, we recorded fracture events uh, which were verified by, from radiology reports and we looked at both the number of events and the number of participants. So in terms of events, there were eight fractures, one in the zoledronate group and seven in the switch group. Uh, and just looking at all events, regardless of whether they were traumatic or not, uh, as a, as a, uh, there were the difference sorry, between seven and one event was of marginal statistical significance. In terms of the types of events, some are in the hand and foot, which are not traditionally viewed uh, in fracture endpoint studies. The remainder were in the wrist, the spine and the ribs. In terms of participants experiencing fractures, it was one versus four, which was not a significant difference. Uh, the asterisk at the bottom notes that only one fracture in each group was deemed to be a fragility fracture. In terms of other adverse events, and before anyone asks, no, we don't have the full adverse event profile data, just the SAE data at this stage. Uh, as you might expect in participants who continued on TDF and initiated uh, zoledronate, the GFR declined by about six mils per minute over the two years, whereas with the switch there was a very modest improvement of about three mils per minute. There were 15 SAEs uh, pooled across the two groups, uh, not different with, uh, by proportions, and no SAE was deemed to be related to any study intervention. There was one uh, transient virological failure in the switch group in a patient who decided that because Kyvexa and Raltegravir were both orange, he'd only take one of them. Um, and he fortunately resuppressed on a second regimen after six months. So of course there are limitations to the data in that firstly, this is almost all white adult men the follow-up's only for two years, but we do have month 36 data that are starting to come in. These data are pre-TAF, pre uh, but I find it hard to conceive how a switch to TAF would be superior to a switch to a Bacavir or an integrase inhibitor, but that hasn't been formally studied. And of course, this study is not powered for fracture events. So in conclusion, in adults with low bone mineral density, Zoledronic acid combined with calcium and plus or minus vitamin D replacement, it's more effective at increasing BMD than switching from TDF. So in other words, if a patient requires intervention for low BMD, TDF switching is not sufficient. Larger and longer studies will be required to determine the impact on fracture outcomes, and the clinical significance, I suspect, will li likely depend on the underlying fracture risk of the individual. I'd like to thank all the participants, all the initial, additional site investigators, site coordinators, the imaging staff, 
the protocol pharmacists and financial uh, support from the National Health and Medical Research Cam Council of Australia and the Bell Naves Foundation. And just lastly, a little plug for the Comorbidity and Adverse Event Workshop, which will be held in Milan, uh, 23 to 5 October, just before EX. Uh, and hopefully there'll be some uh, good bone material uh, at that workshop. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrew. Time for questions? Yes, there's one at the center mic front. Hi, Juan, Ber Juan Berenguer from Madrid. Uh, once that you have shown us that it's better to give soledronate, I mean, for this patient that you have studied, you think it makes sense to compare soledronate alone versus soledronate plus TDF switch? Yeah, uh, look, this was something we grappled with before when we were designing the study. And we certainly thought about a sort of uh, in intervening for, with both. Um, it, I think it was going to make the recruitment a bit unfeasible um, because we couldn't assume that the intervention, we couldn't have a factorial design and assume that the interventions were going to be independent of one another, which would have made the sample size a lot larger. I, I still think people are going to, if somebody's faced with gross osteoporosis or a fracture, people are still going to consider switching the TDF. Uh, so for me, the main point is not to, you know, not to avoid that switch. That's up to the patient and the clinician. It's the point that the, that switch is not the best in, in intervention. It, in the center? Andrew, it seems that in oh. in light of uh, uh, Dominique's data, the, the I mean, here in the middle. In the, I'll take your word for that. Uh, <laughs> in light of Dominique's presentation, uh, one interpretation of, of your results is, uh, as you were just saying, if you have true classic osteoporosis, you need zelandrolate. If what you have is uh, tenofovir-related reduction in bone mineral density, it's not really clear whether the clinical outcomes data would justify any intervention. Well, I think so it's interesting to have the two of you talk about that. Yeah, so look, there's a lot of... Um, and I'll be delighted to get Dominique's uh, perspective, but there are a lot of uh, patients, particularly men, who don't qualify for bisphosphonate therapy. So in my country, to get uh, bisphosphonate, you either have to have uh, a minimal uh, trauma fracture uh, or you have, be, have to have a T-score less than minus three and be over the age of 70. And so the vast majority of my patients wouldn't f qualify and, and don't. So if I'm, I'm monitoring, if I've been monitoring BMD and I've seen them go from a good place to a bad place, um, I am faced with offering them what I, you know, any other cause of a decline in BMD would, for example, corticosteroids would uh, allow them to access a bisphosphonate. But in this setting, it doesn't. And I think that th this sort of data might sort of help push things in, uh, you know, the thresholds for intervening to, in a different way. Final question for Graham Moyle. Uh, so Graham Moyle from London. Um, two short questions. One is, do you think the calcium supplementation is necessary because there's some evidence to say that if you take calcium in that way, it may lodge in your blood vessels rather than your bones, and it may also uh, chelate uh, a relevant antiretroviral that you might be taking, such as an integrase inhibitor uh, product. Uh, do you want to answer that one first? And the other one's really short. So the uh, integrase inhibitor, so participants were advised when the, the warning started to come to take their calcium and their integrase inhibitors at separate times. Um, my limited understanding is that the latest sort of uh, Meta cohort and trial data regarding calcium suggests that maybe the risk is not has been a little sort of overstated. Um, if the prevailing wisdom at the time was everyone should get calcium. Uh, the second question is that uh, Esteban's published a little bit of information about using trabecular bone score as a different way of interpreting uh, the DEXA scanning, and whether you plan to run the uh, TBS protocol to see whether you're having uh, a better response with regards to that? Yeah, that's certainly planned. Okay, thank you, Andrew.
that brings the uh, session to a close. I'm sure you all agree with me. That was an excellent potpourri of uh, comorbidities from brain to feet, from bones to fractures, and of course not to, to remind us not to forget to talk about sex. So thank you very much, and especially to the...